Welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. Motive matters in leadership. And if it was about me trying to get the next title or shame somebody or get in somebody's way, etc., I would not have been successful. It was for me about trying to help another leader solve a problem. Sometimes one they didn't know they had. Most of the times they didn't know they had it and just didn't know what to do about it. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. That clip was from David Porter, our special guest this week. David's had a very diverse career. He hits on many of the highlights in the interview, but to give you an idea, he started in accounting, moved into finance, then business process improvement, then to an HR executive management role, to a few operational and general management roles, to just now starting his own executive coaching and consulting business. He's got some strong insight for us on how to move into those tangent areas where you're utilizing your accounting knowledge, but not necessarily doing accounting on a daily basis. He's had a very intriguing career path. I'll leave the details for David to explain, though. He does a much better job of it than I would. One more item before we get started. If you're listening to this episode on your phone and would like to get updates when we release new shows, text the word accounting. To 44144, and we'll get you signed up on our email list. Once again, it's very easy. Text accounting to 44144. Let's go ahead and get started. Here's David Porter. Well, good afternoon, David. Thank you very much for joining us for the podcast today. Good afternoon, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Well, as I mentioned to you on our scheduling call, one of my team members had happened upon your information online and mentioned to me that you had a really unique career for someone that started as an accountant. And so I really appreciate you taking the time for this because one of the core purposes for the show is to highlight all the different options that there are for people with an accounting background. And I think you're path is a really great example of that. Plus, I know we talked a little bit about your consulting background. I'm sure you're going to have some valuable insights for our listeners there as well. But let's start at the beginning so that we you know, get an idea of how your career has really progressed. At the very, very beginning, how or why did you decide to pursue accounting as a career in the first place? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of a, a strange answer, maybe. But I started school at the University of Florida in 1981, and that was, at the time, one of the worst recessions that the country had experienced since the Depression. Obviously, we've experienced something similar to that back in the 06, 08 kind of period. But at that time, I went into the university not knowing what I wanted to do. I thought it might be engineering. And mortgage rates, just as just to give an example of kind of what the economy looked like back then, mortgage rates were 16%. Unemployment was at 9%, and the federal funds rate was at 20%. And if you kind of compare that to today's numbers, the numbers are staggeringly high back in the early 80s. So there's a fair concern around the economy. So the university required at the end of our first semester a single meeting with, say, an academic advisor. And I went to visit my advisor, and she said to me, what do you want to major in? And I said, well, I'm, I'm having, I'm going through this uh, economics course right now. I'm really enjoying it. I worked for my brother in his restaurant business in Fort Myers, Florida, and I enjoy business. So please tell me what is the toughest major in the College of Business? And she, without hesitation, said, it's accounting. And I said, I'm going to do that. And I, I think the, <laughs> it, it was kind of as simple as that, to be honest with you. The thought being that given the economy, if uh, accounting was very difficult. I told myself that maybe there'd be a fair chance I could get a job when I get out and would be able to eat and clothe myself and, and find shelter. 
And that's really how I came upon majoring in accounting. Interesting. What's the toughest major? I'll do that one. Ah, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you've had a lot of variety. I believe you, you mentioned working at a, a big eight firm at the time. That's right. Yeah, with, down to with, final four now, but at the time it was Coopers and Library. Yes. Coopers. Okay. Was that a job that you got right out of college or were there some steps in between? No. So I got recruited and went to a recruiting fair at the university and started in uh, the Cooper's Punta Gorda office in Southwest Florida. And after a year, transferred to their Jacksonville, Florida branch. So I was with CNL about two and a half years before I left to go into industry. Okay. Were you in audit or tax or... I was I was in audit mainly, but because I was part of small offices my first year at Cooper's, we would do audits during the day. And then at night and on the weekends during tax season, we'd also do some personal and corporate returns. So I was fortunate to be exposed to various elements of accounting and also to confirm the, the belief that I had when I went through corporate tax at the University of Florida that I did not want to be a tax guy. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Do, do you feel, I guess, in retrospect, that having that variety in your background you know, benefited you in any other ways other than proving you just shouldn't be in tax? I think it highlighted the fact that I enjoy doing multiple things. Uh, I think there are probably about six and a half billion people in the world that are better at doing the routine and really good at just following the process for anything to its conclusion and doing that really well. I prefer a blank piece of paper and helping to develop the roadmap and having the exposure to multiple clients, multiple industries, as well as both tax and audit, even in that short two and a half year period was really right up my alley. So it kind of gave me some good exposure and, and helped accentuate, I think, what my preferences already were. Okay. How did, how did you move out of public into your first industry job? Did you go to work for a client or? I didn't actually. Uh, as, it, as it turned out, I had, during the summers, I waited tables uh, at a restaurant called the Bubble Room Restaurant on Captive Island in, in southwest Florida. It's one of the barrier islands right off of the uh, coast of Fort Myers, about two hours south of Tampa. And I knew the owners and had been acquainted with them through my, my older brother who was in the restaurant business while I was in high school and went to work with them then uh, in between semesters at the university. And I got a call from their general counsel who had, was helping them expand the business, going from one to two to three restaurants. They were looking at potentially going public. This was in the late 80s. And so we are looking for somebody to professionalize our accounting and finance and actually set up the process and, and get us going. There's some stock involved, et cetera. And so my wife and I moved from Jacksonville, Florida to Orlando to take that position. Hmm. Okay. You said some stock involved. So you, you came on with some options or an equity interest? Yeah, there was stock involved. But as it turned out, and a great lesson, and I've been fortunate in my career to have options that were in the money and options that weren't um, <laughs> over a period of time. This particular case, the owners who were, were brilliant people, extraordinarily creative and, and really had a great restaurant concept, also believe that, you know, a, a, a common conversation would be, you know, we grossed $20,000 in sales today. I think I'm going to go, and the owner would say to me, I think I'm going to go out and buy that new Mercedes. Um, and I said, well, let's just keep in mind that only out of that $20,000, uh, you know, you, we get to keep about 1000 of it. It's already, it's already taken. And it seems like a, a gross oversimplification that somebody who uh, starts a business and has run a successful business for many years up to that point would have that view and not understand the difference between profit and revenue, but that's kind of what we, we found. So the owners and, and their family members uh, were able to spend kind of more than we made. So we ended up selling the business. And after selling the business, the new owner who I helped get his uh, immigration done and that type of thing came in and he said, I just want to let you know, he's a guy from the UK. And, and he said to me, I want to let you know that I want to spend as little as possible on people, and I never give raises. And I said, good for you. Oh. And six weeks later, I had my next job at Bombardier. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you but for the tip, uh, right? As an aside, to, to, as, a, as a man of his word, I ran into the accountant that replaced me a couple of years later, and she had not received any raises. So he, he was at least uh, had a high, high level of integrity. 
and was honest about who he was. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's funny. <laughs> so you move on to Bombardier, a little larger organization, definitely. Yes. And I know you, you know, you've had several different roles, you know, finance to general management to, to human resources. There, there's several things we could spend time on. So I, what would you like to tell us about? What do you, what have you felt has been the most valuable experience or interesting experience? Well, I think there were probably three experiences that I had that kind of defined my career and helped me get, you know, where I am today. First one with Bombardier, and I was with them for eight years, four years in their mass transit side, we worked on the Walt Disney World monorail as one of our projects. The Senate subway people mover in, in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. was another one of our projects. So that was kind of a rail transit type business. After that division, I went over to the Sea to Ski Do division and Sea to Jet Boats, and, and I was kind of the first one on the ground when we decided we we're going to build, introduce the Sea to Jet Boat and build that in the U.S. And we bought a small boat factory in Benton, Illinois, deep south of southern Illinois. About 7,500 people live there. And turns out there are a lot of traditional boat manufacturers there for whatever reason. And we purchased one of them. They had about 150 people. And we grew that organization from 150 to 1,100 in one year. And we grew from $12 million to $150 million in shipments in that same year. And when we walked in, they literally had a single desktop computer in the controller's office and a single uh, CNC or uh, computer numerically controlled piece of equipment in the factory. And over that year, then we put in place uh, SAP, initial ERP system for materials management, procurement, and finance, and put in professionalized HR and actually put in the first mass production assembly line in the boat manufacturing industry. So that was a pretty cool, wasn't a startup per se, but we were able to kind of turn nothing into something uh, over a period of time. So it was a great experience for me. And I did finance and procurement and IT work was responsible for those three things there. So that for me was a kind of a defining experience. After I left Bombardier, I went to Cessna in their kind of finance and accounting for their parts and, and aftermarket service business is about a $450 million business. And got together with a group of people who were talking about how we could make the business better than it was. And keeping in mind at the time, this is a 75-year-old business. Cessna aircraft is probably 90% of the pilots in the world learned to fly in Cessnas, right? So it's a very proud organization in Wichita, Kansas. And the team that I, this informal team that got together, we were talking about transformation, talking about process-based management, doing some research and some work with Michael Hammer, who wrote book back in the day on re-engineering. And we ended up giving a speech to the executive team, including the CEO, and they asked me to be the spokesperson. So I spoke on behalf of the team. And the next day I got a call, the CEO wanted me to see me in the office. And I didn't really know how, how everybody was going to react to it because change wasn't something that 75-year-old companies did. And he asked me to uh, lead the business transformation effort reporting to him. So told him I didn't know how to do that. And he laughed and said, well, you'll figure it out. And, and so we did. And I spent the next two and a half years or so building a team of about 35 people cross-functionally. And we started redesigning customer acquisition, communication, order fulfillment, various processes in the business, and really going through a pretty fundamental and kind of an amazing change process, which is how I got involved in kind of HR and HR effectiveness, organizational effectiveness, and that type of thing. And then finally left to go to a company at the time was called Clark American. They had a year before had won the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. And they asked me to come lead a part of their performance excellence in one of their divisions. And I did that, became VP of, I guess, SVP of finance when the CFO left to go to the parent company. So I took on HR and finance at the same time. And then about a year after that was asked to head up HR for the overall organization because they were going to actually merge with the number two check printer, John Harlan Company in Atlanta. And we were going to go from a company of about, I guess, about 4,500 people to 7,500 people overnight. And they needed somebody who could actually help with the cultural change. So I took that on uh, for about a two and a half year period, which got me involved suddenly in, in leading HR. So those three experiences, I think, helped define 
a couple of things for me. One was it satiated uh, my curiosity about learning other functions and learning about processes in an overall organization. But it also helped me develop the courage, if you will, to kind of try new things. Because there was, as I determined over a period of time, staying curious and trying to be in the way in, 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 in the sense of helping organizations actually improve was something I got a lot of juice from. So for me, that kind of defined who I became as a leader and and what I enjoyed doing. Okay, wonderful. And actually, thank you. You're transitioning into a a question that I had because you were at Bombardier for eight years. I'm assuming you didn't start as director of finance or, or, or did you? I was, I think my title was manager of finance so when I okay. started in Orlando. Okay. So you progressed and then that experience led to the opportunity at Cessna, which led to the opportunity at Harlan Clark. And, and you said, you know, get in the way and help organizations improve. That is something I hear from accountants frequently as they get into their careers that they want to get into some of the other functional areas. You know, finance still interests them, but they want to get into some of the operational, you know, kind of areas of the business. What do you feel that that you did well in those years that led you to be the one that people would tap on the shoulder for these opportunities? Again, I think for me, being curious and honestly not afraid to walk into a leader's office and tell them that the baby's ugly (laughs) and and do it in in a somewhat tactful way, that's not too counterintuitive. The biggest point, I think, and the distinction that I make when I speak to leaders and when I've led people in, in small and large organizations is that motive matters in leadership. And if it was about me trying to get the next title or shame somebody or get in somebody's way, et cetera, I would not have been successful. It was for me about trying to help another leader solve a problem, sometimes one they didn't know they had. Most of the times they didn't know they had it and just didn't know what to do about it. And there's not actually a long line of people for whatever reason that are willing to raise their hands and do something that may fail. They think that their their career will be scarred, or you know whatever the whatever the reasons we tell ourselves, where you know we can make up some pretty good stories in our own heads, we're our own worst enemy that way. Sure. Uh, but for me, it was really kind of staying present and understanding what you know what was going on, and and, and literally raising my hand and saying, "I'd like to help you here," and and not necessarily "I'd like to have a job title," but simply, "We have a problem over in this division. I'd love to be able to go and take a look at it." and see if I can help and help you come up with a plan. And the interesting thing is when you find a problem and you come up with an initial plan, a leader, there's a tendency for all of us as leaders, if somebody raises their hand to go, all right, go work on that. I mean, that's just, it's just the way it works. And it's uh, it sounds kind of overly simplistic, but that's really the way it happened. And, and I think probably if I looked at my resume, more than half my jobs were jobs that didn't exist before I had them. Um, and again, it was a, it was finding a problem and just going to figure it out. I don't know a, a better way to, to describe it than that. Okay. No, that's a very good point because to paraphrase a little bit, not to seek promotion, but, but to seek a problem that needs to be solved and, and volunteer to help. And, and you're right. Then you're noticed and you're the one that gets asked to tackle it. I guess there's a lesson there too. Don't don't ask if you don't want to be involved. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I saw in here that you also were the president for a short time of Scantron. Was that related to Harlan Clark or how did that yeah, come Sc- up? Yeah, Scantron was uh, one of the one of the subsidiary companies and it was a situation where the boss kind of looked at me. We lost another president and he didn't really know what to do and they needed some tending to while we found the kind of right leader. And so I, I stepped in and, and took over that role and spent about four months, something like that in the role, getting things organized, holding town halls and, and trying to bring. And they had, they had also done a, an acquisition about nine, 12 months before that. So they were still trying to integrate a Scantron acquisition of a Pearson data products company in, in the education business. So Scantron is, as you and, and others may be aware of the uh, kind of the bubble test form company, but we were at the time trying to transition into more software based from the traditional run the Scantron bubble sheets through the different machines. But as it turned out at the time, Scantron had, I think something like 80% 
of middle school and high school classrooms or buildings in the U.S. had Scantron equipment in it. So oh it was a pretty nice installed base and, and an interesting, especially interesting because I was doing it in the first six months of Barack Obama's presidency when, you know, education was, the, the Stimulus Act had come out and education was, you know, one of the number one priorities. So it was a, a very, very quick learning curve until we could find somebody that came out of that education space to take over. Okay. Interesting. So how did your career progress since then, or how has it progressed since then? So after leaving Harlan Clark, I got into doing a few private equity portfolio companies. So I was the CEO of a laser manufacturing company that was in, in, in death throes, and we didn't make it, but we spent a year getting things shipped out and, and giving it our best shot. But I was kind of late to the party on that one. And then we worked on a I worked as CFO and, and also took over operations for a uh, online industrial learning company in Dallas, which we ended up exiting, which was the goal of the private equity company. We sold it to another another company. So I did spend about, I guess it was two and a half years or so, something like that, traveling a lot to remote locations. One was in Dallas, one in Orlando, Florida. And I obviously live in San Antonio, but I wanted to get some exposure and just kind of test my skills in the private equity in the private equity world. So I did that. And following that, I went to work for a company called YouGov, which has online panels for political polling and brand research and that type of thing. And and again, started as CFO there. And as has been my habit, after a couple of years and a couple of presidents, the my next boss left and they looked at me and said, Hey, do you want to be general manager of the US and also be CFO? And I said, Sure, why not? Because one job didn't seem like enough, right? <laughs> um, so so I did that for about a year and a half before I, I left this last year to hang out my own shingle and set up David Porter Advisors. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, I want to get into into your business. Before I forget though, we've had a few guests on the show, a couple that were involved in private equity organizations or private equity backed organizations. How did you come about those opportunities? Did a recruiter seek you out or was it through previous contacts? Because that, that's sort of intriguing to me. How, how no, that's you- a great question. Yeah, I, I'd actually uh, worked with a uh, president for one of our divisions. It was in, originally in the John Harlan company, had left the had left uh, Harlan Clark sometime before I did. And we stayed in touch and we had kind of mutual respect for one another. And he had a problem to solve and uh, found out that I was available and, and called up and said, hey, he said, this is the situation. He was an operating partner and operating partners within private equity work for the private equity and the investors, people that are managing the portfolio. And they have, depending on the size of the business, they may have three or four businesses that they're looking at to try to help improve the performance of. Sometimes the operating partners get involved in actual C-level roles, so they may take on the CEO role, as this particular guy did in, in one of the companies, the industrial learning company. And then sometimes he's just an advisor, as he was with the laser company. So in this case, it was somebody I knew. He introduced me to one of the managing directors at the private equity company, Comvest, and flew to Atlanta, met with him, and we talked a little bit. And three days later, I was on a plane for my first assignment. Interesting. Okay. That's usually how I've heard those situations come about, but I I was curious about that. Okay. Well, tell us about hanging out your own shingle. How did you decide to do that? What are your specialties? What have you enjoyed about it? What has most surprised you? (laughs) Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think, well, the reason I wanted to do it is probably obvious from the discussion that we've had, I I tend to get bored easily with a single job. So having multiple clients, different industries, I've worked in, I think, eight different industries as an employee. I'm passionate about learning. I'm passionate about development. I I always, you know, I'm reading a book a week uh, and have for many years, whether that's around leadership or or something else, to try to continue to improve my skills. So hanging out my own shingle, I, I felt like I had a weird enough background, if I can use that word, that I would be able to not only empathize with people, owners or CEOs, people that are running businesses with what they're going through, that whole notion that it's lonely at the top um, and, and sometimes you don't have anybody to talk to, that I would be able to help them, but also because of the multifunctional roles that I had and kind of seeing organizations in a cradle to grave manner would give me an, an opportunity to help companies that wanted to enhance their performance 
who wanted to improve their not only their their companies but their on the way they're their teams and by focusing on people process and frankly critical measures KPIs if you will key performance indicators that combine then with clear leadership action to accelerate results. Because what I found in my career, something north of 90% of business problems have to do with communication or the lack thereof, how we confront or whether we confront one another with the truth, the ability to go in and, and have straight talk conversations with people. I find that to be respectful. And so I, I use the words respect, straight talk, and results in thinking about my company and presenting my company because those three things together are helpful, I think, in, from a consulting standpoint, as well as from an executive coaching standpoint. So I also work to help business owners, business leaders with their own leadership journey to try to help them become more effective. Okay. And how long have you been out on your own? Eight months now, so just Eight since months. the first of January. So it's still still early days for me. Okay. And, and these services, this coaching, is it typically one on one executive level coaching, or are you doing team events? Yeah, it, it generally starts one on one, but then what what often happens uh, with a CEO or an owner is they believe they have a problem. You know, they want a, a seminar or an event, or they feel like they need to do an offsite. And what I try to do is actually understand what the problem is they're trying to solve. Oftentimes, there's a communication, again, breakdown with one or two team members, and, and then we can make the decision whether to work directly with those individuals or work with the CEO or the owner and, and the person to try to work through kind of what's slowing them down. Because as what often happens is people tell stories about what they think is going on with an individual, and that may or may not actually be what's going on. Usually there's a disconnect in the communication and oftentimes just facilitating the conversation can help people get unstuck. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very true, very insightful. What is your sweet spot for clientele? Are, are you looking at specific industries or sizes of organizations? What, what are you trying to target? Yeah, I mean, at this point, small to mid-sized businesses, and, and again, that's a, a pretty broad range. It's, you know, businesses under I don't know what the definition is now, $500 million probably in revenue. But I'm looking at more in the 5 to $25 million revenue kind of business. And I'm not looking at a particular industry at this point. I've not tried to build a, nit, a niche in any particular area. Okay. Geographically, or are you looking just locally or, or South Texas? I'm, I'm, I'm focused in South Texas, San Antonio, and Austin. But I've spent you know, quite a bit of time over the last four years specifically in the Silicon Valley as well as in New York City. So I'm also prospecting in those areas. My preference is to, is to work in South Texas. Okay. Okay. I ask because although I'm in San Antonio as well, we, we've had guests from really around the state and, and we, we focus quite a bit on Texas, although obviously we have podcast listeners everywhere. But a little plug for you there, David. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you've done so many different things. I mean, what what role or roles do you think you enjoyed the most and why? Well, it, it's interesting. <laughs> the job I enjoyed the most was waiting tables on Captive <laughs> Island. And I say that because it allowed me to do two things. Uh, the restaurant business, while I think it's a young people's game because it's exhausting, honestly, uh-huh. and very difficult, serving especially in a fast-paced restaurant, you get to see process work from beginning to end multiple times a night, which was always fascinating to me and I think helped me kind of get interested in doing process-based management and business transformation many, many years later when I was at Cessna Aircraft. And the other thing is it was good practice. The restaurant industry, just generally speaking, is good practice and practical psychology. And so for me, that was fascinating to see and, and challenging to see whether and determine whether a table of people, a couple, et cetera, wanted to be left alone, wanted to laugh, wanted to have more, you know, be more serious. It varied and every single table was different. So for me, I think I learned and and enjoyed that job as much as any of them. From a professional standpoint, I would say it was the Cessna aircraft, the business transformation job, just because we were doing something that had such an important purpose. It was impacting in the neighborhood of 9,000 employees, 
it was extremely difficult. Almost nobody, you know, there, there's an old saying in change management, the only human that wants change is a wet baby. And it's really true about humans. We want change, but we only want the change that we want, right? It's not the change that somebody else wants for us. So that was a constant challenge from a leadership standpoint, from a strategies and talking to different people and and then rolling them and what we were trying to do, it was extremely difficult, but also extremely rewarding. So for me, that was, I think, the most most enjoyable job I've had since I became a CPA. Wonderful. Well, there are uh, three questions I end every podcast with, and I want to get to those. But, but before, last question along, along these lines, if you could go back and give your younger self just one piece of advice, what do you think that might be? That's a great question. I don't think I can do one because I talk too much. I'm going to try two, but I'll do it quickly. Okay, Mark? Fair enough. <laughs> All right. The The first one, I think, is to stay open to opportunities and be willing to relocate for your career. My wife and I have found we've lived in several different cities in Florida, in Illinois, in Kansas, and now Texas in our 32-year marriage. And we're believers at this point. I'm not sure growing up in Illinois, I believe that, but We think that people grow where they're planted, and every place that we've lived has offered us something different and better, and there's certainly, it's not been without its challenges, but I think a lot of young people especially get caught up in, well, I need to look for a job within, you know, 50 miles of where I went to university, or I need to be near family, et cetera. I'm not underestimating the importance of that, but the world opens up. A whole lot from a career standpoint, if you're willing to try different geographies and different places. So that one, my wife helped me with. Without her, I probably would, would still be in Fort Myers or somewhere else uh, in Florida. But that's an important one. And the second is that people shouldn't be afraid to make a lateral move within a company or even to another company if it provides you with a new and different experience. I think as my background, as we've talked about, shows there was nothing right? Coming out of the University of Florida, getting a CPA and then a certified management accountant and and certified in financial management, doing all those things that said that I was going to head HR for a billion dollar, you know, $2 billion company or lead process improvement efforts or business transformation for a $4 billion company, you know, those types of things that just wasn't even in my radar screen, right? And I I think the, the point is there's a notion that we need to move up, I think, is from an ego standpoint. But lateral moves are actually okay if it actually opens you to a new industry or something else that you can learn. That is great advice because you're right. A lot of people will feel like if they're not moving up, then what's the point? But yes, thank you. Thanks. That's good to share, particularly for our audience. That is good. Well, getting to the the final questions, first one and usually the easiest, what has been your proudest moment? Absolutely building the business transformation team at at Cessna and the results we were able to generate there. It was the hardest thing I've ever done from a professional standpoint. And it's a great, continues to be a great company. And it was a great company when I was there. And I learned to fly into Cessna when I was a kid. So all of that for me has a lot of emotion around it. And, you know, by far, that's the best thing I've done. Wonderful. Well, tell us about a mistake you made and what you learned from it, of course. But frankly, the bigger, the better. We, we like the large mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how, how large this mistake is and, and may sound undramatic and, and a little understated, but I think the one that taught me the most and, and has had has stuck with me. And it was, I was at Bombardier, my first job in Orlando, and there was a leadership meeting and the head of engineering was there. And he said something that was just an outright lie. It wasn't true what he said, and he knew it wasn't. And I called him out on it and shamed him in front of, you know, his boss and his peers and so forth. And he got very angry and, and rightfully so. And I, and I think the maybe obvious lesson there is, A, try not to shame people. But B, if you've got criticism or constructive criticism, do that in private and praise in public. And if you remember that as a leader, it's very difficult to go wrong. But for me, some, whatever it is now, 25 years later, I still remember that day. I still remember that moment. I still remember how I felt. And I still remember his reaction and how he felt. And it was not not a, uh, not a proud moment for me. 
Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that because that is not an easy mistake, so to speak, to share. And I, I agree that the first inclination with some people is, oh, I shouldn't say anything. And then you can swing the other way of, oh, I, you know, that's wrong and I need to do something about it right now. And really both of those are wrong. You're right. It needs, it needs to be maybe addressed or corrected or mentioned, but, but not in, in front of uh, everybody in public. So thank you. Thank you very much. That, that is a good sure. lesson. Well, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? And then we'll say goodbye. All right. That's a, that's a really simple one for me. And I really have to go back a long way to when I was uh, about 12 years old. And at that time, my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Jonas, handed me back a low B paper and said to me these simple words, you are capable of better work. And if anyone had ever said that to me before, I hadn't heard it. And after that, I went on to graduate third in my high school class, received a full scholarship to the University of Florida, a school that my family couldn't afford for me to attend. And honestly, those words, strangely enough, changed my life and how I progressed from that point forward. It sounds somewhat ridiculous, but it's a reminder to me in my own leadership and my own consulting or coaching that we absolutely have no idea when we talk to people or when we try to help people what it is that we might say that might connect with them, that might make a difference for them. And again, it may sound a bit trite, but I've heard from people over, you know, that I worked with 20 years ago about conversations we had back then. And and I've had those conversations with people that have, have helped me along the way as well to thank them. And they're like, what are you talking about? Right. And you just don't remember them. It wasn't important to you, but it was critically important to them. And I think everybody probably has a teacher, a, a minister, a parent, a sibling, a friend, whatever that is, as, you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of a lot of people that come before us. That for me though, at age 12, the game changer. Miss Jonas, right? Is that Mrs. Jonas, Barb Jonas. Barb Jonas. Wonderful. Yeah, that almost makes you want to send her a check every year. She she changed your life forever with that comment. She did. Wow, that is good. Teachers do make a difference. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate you taking the time for this. You gave us a lot of good detail here. And, and actually, I, I would have liked to have delved into it even more, but I want to be respectful of your time. And, and I'm sure you've got just... A whole lot of stories. We could probably do two or three episodes. <laughs> it's just on the early career. <laughs> well, the, as my wife reminds me, I have no problem talking. So that's, <laughs> sometimes some, some good stuff may come out. So hopefully you got some value from this. Thank you. Yes, uh, I did. And I'm sure our audience will as well. So thank you. Well, I've enjoyed much. it, Mark. I appreciate you asking me to uh, participate today. Take care. No problem. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that was our guest, David Porter. Like I mentioned in the intro, he's definitely had a career full of a variety of opportunities. I think he gave us some good advice there in the middle about positioning yourself to be approached about those opportunities. Stay curious and offer to help when you see a problem. And then you naturally become the individual that they ask to lead the team if and when a team is put in place. That's really good advice. I'm going to paraphrase it again, but basically, you know, seek to help before you seek to be promoted. Extremely good advice. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. This has been another episode of Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. If you'd like to subscribe by email and aren't at a place where you can type, simply text the word accounting to 44144 and we'll get you signed up. Once again, it's very easy to remember. Text accounting to 44144. I hope you have a wonderful week. We'll be back soon. There's more to come.